Oh my God, it's so cold. I have my blanket and my hot chocolate down here. I'm so cold. I've begun my wall decor. Jem sent this needlework project in, which has more polish and finishing than anything I've ever worked on in my life. And Kaylee sent a lovely note on the back of this picturesque postcard. If you'd like to contribute to this wall decor, my PO box is in the description. If you spend enough time studying the past, you're going to come across the word legacy a lot. And it's a curious word. If you speak any kind of language, you know that words have feelings as well as a definition. I equate it in my own mind to a kind of semantic personality. Legacy has a personal feeling, which isn't really reflected in synonyms like bequest or even tradition. It has more weight. And on top of that, it has all of this ambivalent potential energy. It can be a good thing, helping to guide positive action and progress. It can also be a bad thing, feeding insular ill will and limiting growth. It can be given willingly or set upon the receiver by accident. You know that way that I'm speaking just now? That vague way where I could mean any number of things? That is actually another fun way that the word legacy is a little bit different. Most of us these days refer to legacy in terms of its abstract definition, the ideas, values, or stories that come down to us from the past. But it also has another definition, and one that is much more concrete. A legacy means literally a gift from someone's last will and testament, usually an heirloom or money. In case you haven't noticed, this kind of semantic wordplay is my bread and butter. I love it. In my History Bounding Your Lifestyle video, I mentioned a similar thing with sense and feeling. Today I'll show you how these two meanings have come together for me in a strange and lovely way. First, a quick story time. My maternal grandmother had children fairly late in life. Her second daughter was born when she was 45. That was my mother. My mother is therefore the youngest cousin on that side of the family by quite a large margin. Between the age and geographical gaps, I never spent much time with that side of the family, and my mother didn't have that many stories that she could remember. About 12 years ago or so, I met my mother's cousins Luella and Roberta. Because they're older, they have more first-hand memories of past generations. So for the first time, I was hearing stories and getting to know more and more about that side of the family. They spun wonderful generational yarns, and they didn't shy away from the unvarnished versions of things. They shared the good, the bad, and the scandalous with us, which for me is the best part of family histories. Fast forward about a decade. We're still separated by geography, but are much closer and in more frequent contact. Luella and her sister were some of my first viewers on YouTube, something for which I never cease to be amazed and humbled. But as a result of this, Luella knew about my love for all things historical. So when she heard that we were moving to a new place, she put some things aside for me, and after my mother came to visit, she sent mom home with a trunk full of antiques that had belonged to the family. So here is an antiques haul. with all of the wonderful things that Luella has gifted me. I am sharing these, as well as selections from an explanatory email, with Luella's permission. Also, Luella refers to these people in her email in relation to herself, and I refer to them in relation to me. So Luella's grandfather becomes my great-grandfather, etc, etc. Dear Liz and Archie, I was delighted you chose to take some family items. I love having things around me which tell a story. In that vein, here are some of the stories about these items. The nursing rocker. This belonged to Grandpa Arthur's mother. The age will be approximately 1870. She lost her hearing, which apparently went very quickly, and she never heard the sound of her two youngest children's voices, including Grandpa Arthur. Imagine how hard this must have been, as Grandpa was a preemie and required extra attention. Antique rocking chairs are my favorite. They're shorter, so I can put my feet on the ground. Plus, the act of rocking is very helpful to my ADHD and the need to fidget while I sit. Without knowing that this one was coming, I had actually already purchased a rocking chair for this space. One of them sits now in our living room, the other one in my studio space. Picture of Grandpa Arthur at two years old in his rocking horse from approximately 1886. He was the youngest of five and a premature birth. When he was born, he only weighed 570 grams or one pound five ounces. They carried him around on a pillow for most of his first year. Grandpa Arthur's bronze boot, 1884. These were done by the Bay Bronze Foundries here in Winnipeg to commemorate shoes that were worn at one year of age. I never knew my great-grandfather, and I have no idea what kind of person he was. 
his survival in the late Victorian period at a birth weight that was approximately one-seventh of what the national average is today is not a reflection of his character, but I find that this photograph is heartening all of the same. Despite the common opinion nowadays that photographs of Victorian children are creepy, personally, I find this one enchanting. Painting Ocean Barriers Painted by Grandpa Arthur's eldest sister Goldie. I never met Goldie, but her daughter Fern lived for a while in Minneapolis, and she would come to visit her aunts in Winnipeg. I asked, and no one's quite sure where this was painted. It doesn't seem to be geographically similar to anything you would find in Manitoba, but it was framed in Winnipeg. My guess is, based on historical rather than biographical information, it was either painted while on holiday, or from a landscape photograph, which was common practice. Here is a photograph of Goldie, who I've decided is my style icon. Before we move on, I want to thank my Patreon patrons and to ask you to join my Patreon at the card above or in the link below. Ongoing support, both moral and financial, from Patreon has been absolutely invaluable to me. I haven't been working the last 18 months, and it would not have been possible to make these videos without help. Please consider helping me make videos by joining my Patreon or by making a one-time contribution to my Ko-fi page at the link below. Thank you to everyone who has already contributed or become a patron. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, back to the antiques. The fireplace screen. I'm unsure if this is Grandma Ella's handiwork. She did more petite point embroidery. Fireplace screens like this one protected people from the intense heat of a fireplace. They would often be decorated with embroidery or painted panels. From the very little that I can tell, this is actually woven tapestry and likely not to be my great-grandmother's handiwork. The Victorian Banners Grandma used to haunt the auction houses in Winnipeg. She bought these from Gray's Auction, and they sat on the mantel. They need some repair, but I love their drama. These actually presented something of a challenge for me, as I didn't know what they were, and I was worried about displaying an item with a dubious history or purpose. Without knowing the name or purpose of a thing, you end up tossing keywords into Google randomly and hoping that you come up with something. Luckily, I worked in a props warehouse in the UK a few years ago, and the majority of my job consisted of doing exactly that within our own database. Another time, I'll share the more colorful of these stories. After a bit of internet scouring, I finally hit upon it. It turns out that they are handheld fireplace screens. These solved my intense confusion about why they would detach from their bases so easily. This is beadwork at the front of the banners. The silk backing has shredded, but otherwise they're in great shape. The compote dish. It is made from carnival glass. Based on my research, this is Fenton carnival glass in what has been called the Mikado or chrysanthemum style in a large compote shape. The color is officially known as marigold and is the most common of carnival glass colors. Carnival glass was also known as aurora glass, rainbow glass, taffeta glass, and disparagingly as the poor man's Tiffany. Carnival glass gets its iridescent sheen from an application of metallic salts while the glass is still hot from the pressing. A final firing of the glass brings out the iridescent properties of the salts, giving carnival glass the distinct shine that it is known for. The little cast bronze boot. Grandma A used this as a paperweight for notes that she made for herself. It sat on the buffet in the dining room. She did her paperwork at the dining room table. This little boot sat on top of whatever she was working on. I really don't feel like this requires any further explanation. It's a cute decoration. I love it. Grandma Ella's Presentation Bible. This was presented by her parents. Archie, you may find some of the illustrations very interesting. I'm not a religious person, and I don't come from a religious family, but holy texts are such an interesting and beautiful window into history, as well as exquisite objects. We've been handling it very little, because the cover and parts of the binding are coming apart. Our plan is to take it to a bookbinder who specializes in restoration. Luella also included a photo album, which is going to be the subject of much examination, and not an inconsiderable source of inspiration for future sewing projects. I'm also including two of Grandma Ella's thimbles and a small pair of scissors. She was a milliner by trade. As a young woman, she worked for Eaton's in Toronto. She was given the opportunity to come to Winnipeg and be the manager of the millinery department. She was only 19 years old at the time. Apparently, the day of the opening of the new store in 1905, she greeted the first customer to come through the doors. She was standing beside the founder, Timothy Eaton. 
Eaton's was a Canadian department store. The Eaton's mail order catalog holds a similar cultural place in Canada as the Sears catalog does in the United States. Sears absorbed the Eaton's company in the late 90s, although then less than 20 years later, Sears Canada closed all remaining locations. These little family artifacts are a literal legacy, pieces of the past that have come down to me. There's value in that, but there's also a touch of danger in the misattribution of an abstract legacy. It's tempting to value objects more because they came from your family, and it's easy to take ownership of that value, as if it's a reflection on you. It's also too easy to hold their ideas too tightly. I think this is the kind of thinking that leads to phrases like primogeniture and keeping it in the family. If I bought these objects at an antique shop, I would like them as much as I do now. The reason that I love them is not because they came from great-grandparents. The real and absolute value of these objects for me is that somebody that I love thought I might like them. I never knew my great-great-grandmother, so when I sit in her rocking chair, I imagine her life with a kind of curiosity, but I think of Luella. When I use the thimbles and the scissors in my sewing, I will think of the earliest days of my YouTube channel. I will remember that Luella would often have seen my videos before my mother had, and remind her to watch them. This little collection of treasures is a concrete legacy from generations past. A legacy that I've received from Luella is one of generosity, storytelling, support, and kindness. If each of these items vanished tomorrow, my mind would still be full of stories and gratitude. This is the curious power and the sly double meaning of legacy at work. So thank you, Luella, for the gifts and for the stories. Thank you, Mom, for driving them around for me. And thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please subscribe and like this video and become a patron to keep these videos coming out regularly. Have a great week and I'll see you soon. Or why can't I say that line? That tone needs to change dramatically. Oh my God, it's so cold. Getting right cozy up in here. Ow, 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 ow. Foot, 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 foot. Stop sitting on foots, Liz. They hurt, ow.